Welcome to the Council of Better Business Bureau's podcast, Better Business, Better Series, where we will explore top of mind topics with business and industry leaders to understand the leading trends and innovations that continue to push the envelope in today's marketplace. For the Better Business, Better Series podcast, I'm Will Johnson. RVing is a big business in the United States, and for those of us without the funds to buy a home on wheels, we can now rent one. What might have seemed extravagant in years past is now attainable and easy to do, and if you just want to dip your toes into the RV lifestyle, Outdoorsy is a great place to get started. Jeff Cavins is CEO and co-founder of Outdoorsy. He's here to tell us more about the business and what's behind the success of his company. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. So let's start by telling our listeners who might not be familiar with Outdoorsy what your business is and, and where it stands today. Well, Outdoorsy is, simply put, a marketplace for people who own RVs or camper vans, travel trailers, even um, vehicle, some any form of a vehicle with sleeping quarters, to be able to list that vehicle in our marketplace and make that vehicle available to renters from all around the world that would like to come and rent the vehicle for recreational travel. And uh, much like Airbnb, we built that for the RV, motor coach, travel trailer category. Right. That's the obvious comparison. I'm here. I'm sure you yeah. get a lot, Airbnb. Um, I wish I had thought of this idea. <laughs> it's more than just thinking about it, though. You've put it into action uh, in, in a lot of ways. But it, it's, it's it's such a great concept. Clearly, there's a lot of enthusiasm about this type of experience now for people. Yeah, there really is. Um, there, There's a renaissance happening. And it's not just in the U.S. It's a cross-cultural, global phenomenon. Outside of the U.S., they call it caravanning. That's the term. It's not used. The, the RV yeah. term's not used outside of the U.S. But um, this this mobile road trip lifestyle has really caught on, has caught on, um, not only with millennials, but boomers and Gen X and retirees who are wanting to return to the environment and enjoy outdoor experiences and get out of the urban, you know, the urban pressure uh, cooker that we all live and work in, in uh, in our careers. Yeah, uh, you know, I was in Canada last year, and like you say, caravanning is a big deal in other parts of the world. And yeah, you go there, and all of a sudden you realize that everyone's kind of doing this. It's part of the culture, and not that it isn't here, but it's it's it seems more established there. Yeah, it really is. Um, uh, for example, in Europe, um, caravanning and camper vanning is considered a, a relatively high end type of travel experience, whereas the moniker on RVs in the U.S. Um, historically had been looked at as, oh, it's something the retirees do, or it's, you know, right. maybe it's the middle class vacation uh, alternative. But the reality is people have fallen in love with outdoor recreational travel. And with these vehicles, we take you places where Airbnb, Hilton, Hyatt, Marriott can't take you. Now, there's no Airbnb in Yosemite. There's no Hilton in Yellowstone. And this is where people want to go now. And, you know, it's the new, I call it the new drug that used to be taking your family to the Eiffel Tower was enough to, to show them the vacation for the year. But now people want these quick getaway experiences and they want them to be in outdoor, uh, outdoor environments and places that are um, where they can appreciate the environment and the planet in a way that they were never able to. Well, I want to talk about focus on the U.S., but uh, one only has to watch the Tour de France to see the sort of caravan exactly. lifestyle in, in France, at least. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about, I, I'd love to hear about how businesses and ideas came into being and, and how it grows from a concept into a real business. That's what we like to talk about here. Tell us about how Outdoorsy came into being. Well, this is, this is my seventh tech company. I've spent my entire career in, in tech, most of, it, most of it in Silicon Valley. I've had, I've CEO two publicly traded companies and led a third publicly traded company to you know, quite large scale uh, internet companies. And then my co-founder and my Actually, now my fiance Jennifer Young grew up in the advertising industry. She was a big consumer marketer, helped build Ogilvy in Australia. Then she moved to London and helped build J. Walter Thompson, where she became a managing director at JWT. Then she moved to New York City and turned around two big agencies, RMG Connect and uh, Wonderman, working for the WPP family. And Jen and I met. Okay, so you, it, it, it's safe to say you guys have some background and experience. Jen had a big background in, in large scale consumer marketing and brand, and I had a background in building, you know, successful tech companies. And um, we both sat down. We were we met each other at a board meeting for a company we were serving on the board of up in Vancouver, Canada. I travel into town, and she and I would start talking after board meetings. And I said, you know, I want to start another company, but this time I want to do something 
that celebrates the outdoors. I'm tired of sitting in buildings under fluorescent lights. And she said, you know, I'm in the same position. So we started coming up with a variety of ideas. And one of them was, was this. Another one was building a, a software platform for campgrounds and campsites around the world where you could book your campsites through an internet browser experience. But we came up with the idea of the RV marketplace uh, a la, you know, it's the moral, moral equivalent of Airbnb. It's just that we deal with rolling stock and a different type mm-hmm. of use case. And to figure it out, Jen and I decided to sell everything we owned. So I sold my home and all my belongings in San Francisco. She sold her property in Vancouver, where she had just recently moved from New York City. And wow. we sold everything we owned, uh, by the way, which is a cathartic experience if you ever had a chance, if you ever have a chance to do it. What we had, so I've heard. what we had left was basically family mementos that we put in a ten by ten storage locker. We bought an Airstream trailer and a, four, a GMC uh, truck, and we drove across America and lived in that Airstream for seven and a half months. And we crisscrossed America, north and well, really North North America, so Canada as well. We crisscrossed North America basically seven days a week for seven and a half months, and we made a pact. We said. Because if this company is successful, we can never afford for our Airstream to be seen in a Sheridan or a Hilton parking lot. We have to live in the Airstream mm-hmm. every single night. And we're going to figure out yeah. if we can get along and build a company together. And we're also going to learn what people do that don't live in Manhattan and San Francisco, which is where we had spent most of our time and our experiences. And we learned that you know, there's 40 million Canadians, there's 324 million Americans, and the ones that don't live in Silicon Valley in Manhattan, this is what they do on weekends. They go camping, they go fishing, they have family outings, they go to national parks, they go to NASCAR and Formula One races, and they go to Major League Baseball spring training and NCAA tailgating events. And we realized that the recreational vehicle lifestyle was as ingrained in the American culture as anything we'd ever seen. And we realized, wait a minute, there's 18 million registered RVs that on average set in people's driveways or backyards 11 and a half months out of the year unused. Right. My neighbor down the street has one. Yeah. yeah. 12% of American households owns a recreational vehicle and often they don't use it. They have a little bit of a same kind of a use use cycle as a timeshare will have. You know, year one, mm-hmm. the romanticism of owning one, you know, you'll, you'll use it a bit. By the time year two comes around, you realize you're not really taking the vacation time you wanted. And by the time year three comes around, you realize that you've stopped using it because you've done your thing, right? You saw the Smoky Mountains and you saw the Appalachian Range and that's kind of what you wanted to do. The problem is- And you're starting to feel guilty about that thing in your driveway. Yeah, you have a mortgage payment, an insurance payment, sometimes a storage payment if it's in a remote storage facility. and um, But you can't rent it because every state, and this is pretty common around the world, even you know in Canada and other countries, There are the insurance industry that have personal insurance policies that have a clause in those policies called the business exclusion clause. Basically, it says thou shalt not rent. And what happens is because some of these are considered commercial class vehicles and the insurance industry just decided we don't want anybody renting these things out. So you guys had to find a way around that. We did. And we learned that also every year, 40 million people around the world go to a web browser and type in a search a search request to rent an RV in North America. They want to, Germans that want to come see the Grand Canyon or the Swiss that want to come yeah. see, you know, Key West, Florida. And essentially with no luck. So what they do is they end up renting a car from Hertz or Avis and they stay in, uh, you know, Holiday Inns and Sheridans along the way as they travel America. And we said, okay, well, there's enormous demand. There's 40 million people that want to rent them. There's 18 million of these things just sitting here idle, unused. We have available to us over 6 billion rental days. Um, there's a marketplace here because you have the demand and you have the supply. There were just regulatory problems that prevented the supply to be legally rented. So we went and solved it with the insurance industry. We worked with insurance underwriters and spent about uh, two years working on a product that we created, which is one-click automated um, consumer ex- uh, insurance that insures everyone that rents the RV, operates the RV, insures the owner, and it insures third parties. Because sometimes an RV might back into a third party at a gas station or something like that. And we right. created one-click insurance, just like Amazon has one-click ordering in their website. And we made sure that it worked across all 50 states, including Canada and Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, anywhere where the U.S. has a military installation. 
So we have guys in the Air Force in Guam that actually have a camper van and they rent it to their buddies in Guam and it's fully insured because that's a U.S. controlled territory. So there were certainly uh, businesses and outfits out there that had their own fleet of RVs, but what you did is make it possible for people who have their own RVs to then rent it to someone else, just like, as we mentioned, Airbnb, right. and for people to find probably maybe a, a less expensive option in some cases? That's right. And along the way, as we were traveling around the country, we met thousands of people. I, mean, we, I, I personally conducted over 1,200 in-person interviews with people that wow. I met in campgrounds and RV parks, and I'd ask them questions about, you know, why do you own this? If you could turn it into a revenue center, would you? Would you be comfortable if I can insure you? And the resounding responses were, were that we saw the, the emergence of the marketplace and the psyche of the consumer was, was already there. Somebody just needed to put it together. So we created a website. We created uh, bank secure payments so you don't have to transact in cash. We created insurance. We created a roadside services program where we have 40,000 roadside service um, partners who will come and take care of whether it's a tow or it's a battery charge or it's a flat tire that needs to be repaired. And they can operate in these very remote locations like you know the northern rim of the Grand Canyon and Sequoia Park. And uh, we, we created this marketplace, and the owners of RVs learned. This is where the interesting story is. Owners of RVs learned that if they rent their RVs out on the site, they can make some people. We've had people make over fifty thousand dollars in a summer with one RV. Wow! So we've had we've had we have a housewife in Huntington Beach. She just bought her fifth RV, quit her job. This is all she does is run her business on outdoorsy, and she's making enough to send her daughter her daughter through law school at uh, UC Berkeley, the UC Berkeley Law School. So along the way, your your business model is that you you take some percentage of the transaction cost. That's right. And and most of that's so that we can cover our underwriting costs with the insurance industry, because it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's not cheap, of course. And along the way, we learned that there were a lot of professionals that had fleets that they were renting to consumers, but many of them didn't have insurance. They were engaged in this essentially illicit transactions. And we were able to bring insurance to them as well. So we got a lot of the professional side of the industry that came onto our platform, as well as this peer-to-peer side. All of this doesn't exist without the growth of the sharing economy. Um, Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, the sharing economy has certainly helped us because the um, people trust. People trust one another more than they will uh, trust a corporation. You know, institutional trust in corporations has, we've had Volkswagen Dieselgate, we've had the Sony Pictures email hack, we've had the Experian data losses and so on. And we found that consumers will trust ratings and reviews on a website that rate services and or other people more quick, uh, more quickly and with greater trust than they will a corporation who's trying to market a message to us and sell us something. And so the sharing economy created this new concept of trust mechanics, ratings, reviews, trust scores, and so on. And uh, that helped us a great deal. So every one of our every one of our transactions is rated by the user. We don't curate those those ratings, so those reviews are put out on the internet. And so, as a lister or a renter on our site, you want to own you want to earn the social currency related to being a person of high trust. It's very important to people. Um, there's so much transparency now between consumers who transact with one another where that didn't exist before between the consumer and the corporation. And uh, as a result, that spurs confidence in the marketplace and it makes people feel safer. And uh, certainly, you know, the trust mechanisms help make the marketplace uh, a place where there's a lot of liquidity, which means transactions that happen without a lot of friction. Let me ask what's next for Outdoorsy. Are you staying the course now with uh, the the current business or it plans to grow it in other directions or internationally? Do you have your sites there as well? Yes, we, we started expanding internationally at the request of customers. So we would have Customers come here from Australia, New Zealand, uh, Germany, of course. German, Germans and Dutch are big, big uh, travelers and uh, recreational vehicles. And they would go back home and they would send us emails saying, please open up in our country. Uh, we know people that want to list their camper vans and caravans. So we opened up in Canada the early part of this year. It's been very successful for us. We opened up in New Zealand and Australia three months ago. We just went live in the UK two weeks ago. And we're going live in Germany and France uh, before the end of August. And it's really just following the consumer demand of people who have experienced our platform. And it's a lot like Uber. 
So someone would fly to New York and they'd download the Uber app and they would use it while they're in New York and they go home to Chicago or Houston and they click on the Uber app and there were no cars. And Uber saw, wait a minute, there are a lot of clicks happening on our app in Houston or Chicago. We should start getting more drivers in those markets. That's right. how they expanded. So right. we're doing the exact same thing. And Jeff, so uh, to wrap up, to learn more, if, if someone is interested in taking a RV trip or caravanning, as we they say, outside yeah, of the U.S., yeah. Or listing their RV. Where, where do they go and what, what do they have to do? All they have to do is go to Outdoorsy.com. So just visit Outdoorsy.com, and there will be a button that will say list your RV, or there will be a search field that says look for RVs to rent, type in your dates, and then the website will just take you step step by step through the process of either listing or renting. All right, Jeff. Uh, and tell me, you've you've been doing this now for three years, a little more? Yeah, we went live in 2015. Okay. So we're, uh, you know, the company's experiencing – uh, rapid growth. And uh, a lot of that is because of the, the demand of the consumer and, of course, the geographic expansion as well. All right. Well, Jeff, uh, best of luck to you. And thanks a lot for joining us today. Tell us about or- Outdoorsy.com. Really interesting business. Great. Right, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And if you would like to learn more, once again, you can go to Outdoorsy.com. My thanks to my guest, Jeff Cavins, CEO and co-founder of Outdoorsy. If you'd like to learn more about the Better Business Bureau, visit us at BBB.org. And for the Better Business, Better Series podcast, I'm Will Johnson. You just enjoyed Better Business, Better Series podcast. Be sure to tune in next month for a brand new episode. To learn more about our other shows, visit betterbusiness.blueberry.com. That's betterbusiness.blubrry.com and subscribe. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the Better Business Bureau, Council of Better Business Bureaus, or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Blueberry's Terms of Service.